All right, John chapter number three. Let's dig right in there. There's a lot to cover in this chapter and really what the, uh, even though it's not very long, there's just so many, like verse after verse, there's so many key doctrines found in this passage. I'm not going to get into all of them because some, a lot of these things are going to come up again later in other chapters of the book of Matthew, but let's get into what we can here. Verse number one, the Bible says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the first subject we're going to be dealing with, because it comes up multiple times, is this, this concept or the subject of repentance. There is a false doctrine about repentance that is plaguing churches in the United States of America today and all over the world. Amen. This isn't just here. There is a false concept and a false doctrine that teaches that the word itself repent. There's, there's people are ignorant of what the word itself even means. The word repent, probably, oftentimes when you have problems like this, it's because words that don't use, they're not used in regular, in our regular communication, regular vocabulary. You know, you don't use the word repent other than just in a church setting, right? That's the only time you usually ever hear or would use that word. And what people have done, they've taken the word repent. And if you ask the majority of, of Christians out there, what does the word repent mean? They're going to tell you, turn from your sins. That's going to be the answer they give you as a definition for repent. And that is a false definition. It's not true. That is simply untrue. I don't care what you've heard before. I don't care what you've believed before. The word alone, repent, does not mean to turn from your sins. Now, if that were true, there are many instances in the Old Testament where God repents. And if the definition is turn from your sin, then that means that God turned from his sin patently false. God doesn't have any sin. God has no sin to turn from. So obviously that cannot be the definition. And if you'd like, you could turn to Jonah chapter 3. I'm not going to preach an entire sermon on repentance. I've done it multiple times in the past because it's, it's worthy of an entire sermon. But we're going to turn quickly to Jonah chapter 3 because this is probably one of the most important verses on the subject if you're going to teach it real quickly and kind of easily and to get just to get the point across of what it means to turn from sin and that it's a really a works-based salvation that if someone tells you you have to repent of your sins to be saved that is a works-based salvation now it's also important to understand that sometimes people use terminology and they use words without really thinking about the meaning and they don't actually mean that you have to have a works-based salvation in order to be saved. People just have a tendency to repeat things that they've heard over and over again and haven't given them much thought. However, I do think it's important to probe deeper if you have to ask somebody, well, what do, you, what do you have to do to be saved? Oh, I repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. Right? If someone gives me that answer, I'm going to ask questions a little bit further to see what's in their heart, to see what they really believe. Are they really trusting that you have to turn from all of your sins? Well, do I have to turn from all of my sins? What does it mean to turn from all of my sins? Because the way I understand turning from sins would mean that I'm doing sin. Well, I'm going to turn from that. If I turn from that, I'm not going to do it anymore. Makes sense. Now, is it a good thing to repent of your sins and to turn from your sins? Amen. I'm all for it. Yes, let's turn from our sins. Let's not sin anymore. That's why you hear so much preaching against sin at this church. That's why we preach the law. That's why we preach, hey, let's do what's right. But you know what that doesn't do? That doesn't save your soul. Turning from your sins does not save your soul. Jonah chapter 3, verse number 9 Look what the Bible says in Jonah chapter 3, verse number 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? So there's an example of God turning, repenting, right? He has no sin. The word repent doesn't mean turn from your sin. Now, it can be a turning. It's a turning. It's a changing. It's a, it's a rethinking. 
That is what the word repent means. You always have to get it in the context in order to understand just what the word itself. If you just see the word repent by itself, the only time you're going to have sin involved is if it's in the context of the verse. If the Bible said repent of your sins, then that's what it means. But if it just says repent and there's no mention of sin, it doesn't automatically have anything to do with sin. It's just a rethinking. If it, and li that's quite literally the definition is, you know, where the, where the root comes from of pent, if someone's pensive or in Spanish, pensar, it's the same root of, of being thoughtful, thinking, and rethinking again. That's what it is. Re is doing something again. Rethink, repent. That's what you're doing. So in this case in Jonah, God is going to destroy Nineveh because it's a wicked city, because they were doing all kinds of wicked acts. They were involved in great sin. So as a result, he was going to judge them. But what they did, they decided to humble themselves. And the king humbled himself. And he wore sackcloth and ashes. And they said, you know, God, we're sorry. We're not going to do this. And they started to change their ways and live a good life and stop sinning and, and, and get rid of that, that, you know, obviously they didn't stop sinning completely, but they're getting rid of really bad sins that they had been guilty of and committing. And one of the things that he says is like, well, who can tell? Maybe God will change his mind and not destroy us. You know, the preaching was saying, you're going to be destroyed. Yet 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. That was the preaching. But he's saying, you know what? Maybe God will change his mind about that once he sees that, hey, we're listening to them. We're sorry, God. We're not going to do it again. That's the repentance that God, that they were hoping God was going to do, is change his mind, not do the destruction, and turn away his fierce anger that we perish not. But then you say, yeah, well, that's what I'm talking about. See, in order to save your soul, you need to, you need to just stop sinning and do good works. Well, look at what he says, what, what they end up doing when they, when they turn from their evil way, when they turn from their wickedness. It says in verse 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So repenting of sin, turning from an evil way, not doing those sins anymore is considered works. Amen. And this is why I love this passage because it just clearly gives you definition. There is no other way to interpret this passage. It's literally saying when God saw them turning from evil way, he saw works. He saw works. So how are you going to tell me that I have to turn from my evil way in order to be saved, but then in the same breath say, well, it's not of works. Right. You're contradicting yourself. It doesn't matter what your definition of a word is. It matters what the Bible means by it and the Bible's definition of a word. Right. Anyone could come up with, I don't care if you go to the dictionary. Well, the dictionary says repent, says turn from your sins. I don't care because that's not the way the Bible's using it. If that's what the Bible meant, then God has sin. Right. It's foolish. There are so many places we could turn to to prove, you know, what repentance means and do a whole in-depth thing. Jonah 3.10 just, just handles it very readily. If you don't have this as, as one of your soul winning verses to go to when you come across somebody who tells you you have to repent of your sins, add this passage. It explains so much in itself. One, it's the example showing you where God repents. And two, it shows you that repentance or turning from wicked ways, I should say, not repented, but just turning from evil way, repenting of sin, is works. God saw that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. He said he was going to do it. He changed his mind. He didn't do it. That's repentance. So when John comes preaching in the wilderness, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, when we look at the context, if we just had that verse alone, it's not even necessarily very clear what they are supposed to be repenting of and for what purpose. The purpose is for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is upon us. Okay. Well, if this is referring to people needing to get saved and they need to repent, then you know what they need to do? They need to change their mind and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, or at, even at this point, in God, in Jehovah, 
believeth on him that sent me, right? Put their faith in him, right. trust in him, and stop trusting, stop believing in whatever it was that they thought was going to save their soul. Doesn't matter what it was. But I'll tell you this, I don't know anyone who's trusting in their sin to save their soul. That would be the only context you say, well, I have to turn from my belief in sin to get saved because I have to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Nobody is believing in their sin to save them. Because right. here's what happens. When a person turns from their sin, the only way you can turn from sin is if you're turning to the law. Yep. Amen. Because by, by not sinning, you're obeying the law. Amen. So you turn from sin, not to the Savior, to the law. That's why it works. Yeah. Now, look, it's a good thing to do. I'll say it again. Amen. Yes, I believe in that type of repentance, but not to save your soul. Yes, we should be repenting of our sin daily, but not to save our souls, not to give us eternal life. Because if we had to do that, eternal life wouldn't be a gift. It wouldn't be free. It, would, it, it wouldn't be by grace. It would be by works. And this is such an important topic. I don't feel like I could hit on this hard enough because there's so much deceit out there. There's so much wrong, so much false teaching of people who can say so many things so close to being right. And then they add in that works for salvation and the whole thing just becomes no good. Garbage. Garbage. Utter garbage that's going to damn souls to hell because you're adding in, you're sprinkling in that works and saying what Jesus did isn't enough. No, you have to turn from your sins. You have to do a good, live a good life and follow commandments. Uh-uh, not for my salvation. Jesus bought and paid for my salvation 100% in full. It is finished. He paid for all of it. The whole thing. I just received it as a free gift. I don't deserve it. I, it doesn't matter how many sins I turn from. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't deserve eternal life. Never will. You just have to receive it as a free gift. So John comes on the scene. He's saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse number three. Or actually here. No, before we even get into this, I want to I show you. I, I forgot I even had this in my notes. Acts chapter 19. Because people will make a big deal out of this. Well, John preached repentance. Jesus preached repentance, right? So we're going to preach repentance. But they changed the word. They changed the definition. They changed the meaning, which we covered that. But thank God we have Acts chapter 19 because there's multiple places where we see in the Gospels where it's recording, John the Baptist preached, repent ye. Repent, for the King of Heaven is at hand. But we don't really get a lot of his teaching, a lot of his preaching, in the, in the few chapters that cover the, the life of John the Baptist. But we do see this over and over again. He's saying, repent. We say, okay, we got to repent. The Apostle Paul explains exactly what he was preaching. Because what was he doing? One of the things he was doing is baptizing people, right? John the Baptist was baptizing a lot of people. It was a new thing. It wasn't something that had been done before. It wasn't part of their you know, routine to baptize people in the Old Testament, but John the Baptist came on the scene and he's starting to baptize people and he's preaching, he's preaching boldly, he's out in the wilderness, he's dressed all rough, you know, wearing a leather belt and, and eating locusts and wild honey and just, you know, kind of just out there. But he's making a big stir and a lot of people are coming to see what's going on and he's out there preaching and he's preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 19 tells us what he was saying, what he was teaching, what he meant when he preached for people to repent, when he preached the baptism of repentance. Verse number one in Acts 19 says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So he comes across these guys, they're disciples, right? They're claiming to be Christian. You know, we're disciples of Jesus Christ. Great. How you doing, brother? You know, and hey, you got the Holy Ghost since you believe? I don't know what you're talking about. Holy Ghost, what's that? He says, well, unto what then were you baptized? 
Now, that also says a lot, too, because you've got people these days saying, no, 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 the disciples, and everyone, they baptize in the name of Jesus only. Only baptize in the name of Jesus. You only say, baptize you in the name of Jesus. If, if that were the case, then why would Paul even be questioning them? Well, unto what then were you baptized? Right. Jesus said to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. So if you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, you should probably remember that, that you were baptized in the name of the Holy Ghost. What were you baptized unto then? And they said, and then John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. Look at this, in verse number four. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people. So now we get to know what exactly did John say unto the people. We know he said repent. We know he was baptizing people. Well, what was he saying? Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. So when John preached the baptism of repentance, when John said repent, what was he telling the people to do? Believe. Yes. Was he telling them to turn from all their sins and never do anything wrong and follow the law? No. You know what he said to do? Believe on the one who came after me. Believe on Jesus Christ. Hey, I'm not even worthy to, to unloose the latchet of his shoes. That's the Messiah. That's the Lamb of God. Believe on Him. That's the repentance necessary. Believe on Him. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They believed. They got saved. Because then they finally understood, oh, that's what He meant. Go back to, uh, to Matthew chapter 3. So yes, did John the Baptist preach repentance? Absolutely. What did he mean? When he preached repentance, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that simple. So in that regard, do I believe a person has to repent to be saved? Absolutely. Not repent of their sins. Repent and believe the gospel. Yeah. Repent of your unbelief. Repent of believing in idols. Repent in your Pharisee religion. Repent in your own, of your own works, your own dead works. As the Bible says also in the book of Hebrews, you know, repentance of dead works and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the basics. That's what the Bible's teaching here. And it's evident. The problem is people just had the wool pulling over their eyes for so long. And just because you've got a preacher just up and repeating himself over and over and over again doesn't make it true. And you'll never see, you'll never see in the scripture, repent of your sins to be saved. Never one time. We do see when the man asks, sure, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We see that. We see whosoever believeth in him is not condemned. We see that. We see, we see tons of verses about believing. But turning from your sins... No. The only times you're going to see passages like in Ezekiel or in the old, just in any place in the Old Testament, the book of Kings, that's talking about people repenting of their sins and of their wrongdoings and of things like that. It's referencing a nation or a group of people or people physically dying on this earth. That's how you get spared, just like Nineveh. Nineveh was spared physically from being destroyed because they turned from their evil ways. And it was works. If you have a wicked nation that decides to turn from their evil way, God can choose to not destroy them based on their works. God told all the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, repent. Because they weren't doing the works he wanted them to do. And if you don't repent, he's going to take away their candlestick. He's not going to recognize them as a legitimate church. But nowhere in any of those places is it talking about the individual soul being saved from hell. No. It's talking about a, a nation being destroyed, a city being destroyed, a church being destroyed, but not an individual soul. Two different things. Very clear when you look at context. That's why, read, you know, read your Bibles. <laughs> just, just read them every day. Don't, don't let people screw your head around. If you're reading the scripture and you got the Holy Ghost because you're saved, that's going to guide you and lead you into all truth. 
So John the Baptist, repent ye. Look at verse number 3 in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 3. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now this is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 40. If you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to see this over and over again in the book of Matthew. Lots of references to Old Testament scripture, lots of prophecies. Even John the Baptist was prophesied as coming on the scene. And he was fulfilling prophecy. And John the Baptist is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, what it means to cry, it's not weeping, right? The, the, the word weeping is what we oftentimes will say is crying. Like if I say, oh, my son hurt himself and he was crying. We mean, I mean that he'd be weeping, that he's shedding tears, right? That's the way that we use the word crying today. But when you see that in the Bible, that's not the way it's used. They use the word weeping to, to explain that. Crying is like crying out, lifting up your voice and crying out and shouting out. That's what crying is. So John the Baptist, what was he doing? And you say, why do you Baptists always got to yell when you preach? Well, we got a good example with John the Baptist. He was a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Repent! The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's some Baptist preaching. John the Baptist. He is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And, you know, there's other places the Bible talks about preachers being instructed to, you know, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Cry aloud, spare not. But in Isaiah chapter 40, there's another interesting thing. Uh, many of you may have known this already. Uh, some of you may not have. And, and I've, I've heard this, and I've never tested it 100% completely, but I've seen a lot of correlations. Has anyone ever heard that the book of Isaiah is like a mini Bible? Have you heard that before? Isaiah, um, what that means is the first 39 books correlate to the first 39 books of the Bible. So like the first chapters, I mean, first 39 chapters, you're like, you look at Isaiah chapter 1, you're going to find um, some very clear references from Genesis. And Exodus and Leviticus, you know, in chapter 2, 3, 4. Well, chapter 40 would correlate with the book of Matthew, right? And that, that's where we are now. And we see Matthew. So obviously, you've got a lot of chapters in each book to kind of correlate and, and find how it fits in here. But when you start looking at these, it's not like a stretch in the book of Isaiah that, oh, yeah, that kind of fits. I mean, these are incredible. Like, I mean, this is, a, this is like a direct quote. Like, yeah, of course, you're going to associate Isaiah 40 with Matthew by this verse alone. This is a real famous passage. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. And um, that's what we get from Isaiah 40, verse number one. The Bible says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So this is a prophecy concerning obviously the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is saying that the voice of, of him that crieth in the wilderness, this is John the Baptist crying in the wilderness, and what's he supposed to be doing? Preparing the way of the Lord. What he's saying is, and it's actually what he's doing is, he's saying to the people, prepare ye, ye is plural, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Hey, get your, get your act together. Jesus is coming on the scene. The Lord is coming to be among us. Get yourselves right. Get together. Get saved. We're going to make his path straight. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna set the scene and make everything ready for our Lord to be here. So he comes earlier in advance, just getting, shaking people up, get them ready. Hey, wake up, you spiritually asleep people. Get busy, get moving. The Lord's coming. And, and you know, we need that. People in general need that warning. Like, hey, we, 
Let, let's get things ready. Jesus Christ is going to show up on the scene. Let's get things prepared for him. And that's what he was doing here. And of course, Isaiah chapter 40 is great. There's so many things here, you know, speak comfortably. The, the children of Israel have gone through lots of periods of being oppressed and everything like that. And they've been chastised for their sins. And the Bible says here, they've paid double for their sins. You know, they were sinning against God and, and they definitely paid for it. But now he's saying, speak comfortably. Speak comfortably in Isaiah 40. You know, John the Baptist come. He's telling them to prepare the way of the Lord. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and high hill shall be made low. It's basically meaning God's going to start righting some wrongs. People who are really low are going to be lifted up. And those that are, that are proud and, and lifted up in themselves are going to be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight. The rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Jesus Christ is revealed in the New Testament. He's, he's revealed unto the world and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Great prophecy. Go back to Matthew chapter number three. So this is John's mission. This is John's purpose. John the Baptist is just preaching so that people will get themselves together, prepare the way of the Lord. He is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Verse number four, and the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Now, this is, this is also important to note that according to Jesus Christ, he said there is not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. Among them born of women, there is not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. Obviously himself accepted. And what do we see about John the Baptist? He was kind of rough around the edges. He wasn't all polished up and prettied up and, you know, wearing fancy clothing. And he didn't have the, the suit and tie and everything else and making himself look that great. He had a raiment. He had, his clothing was made of camel's hair. Leather and belt about his loins. And he ate locusts and wild honey. He wasn't faring sumptuously every day and eating such nice meals. He was concerned about preaching the message. He wasn't concerned about his own comfort. He wasn't concerned about, you know, living for himself. He was concerned about doing his job. And that's a great example that we need to have. Hey, we got the directions to heaven right here. We don't need GPS. <laughs> Open up the Bible. All right. Verse number five. Let's keep reading here. The Bible says in Matthew 3, 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, I want to touch on this just, just briefly here. Um, people, you know, obviously John the Baptist is making a big stir. He's out there and people are coming unto him to get baptized. They're hearing his preaching. He's preaching hard. He's crying out in the wilderness. And he's trying to get people right with God. I think, yes, he's getting people saved and baptized, but at the same time, I think he's also just trying to get people right with God. I think he's preaching righteousness to just get people like, you know, <laughs> hey, the Lord's coming, right? Even if you've already been saved, let, let's, let's step it up a little bit and start doing things and get ready. And that's why, you know, people are coming, they're getting baptized. And mind you, this is, it's not like people had been, you know, even people who have been saved before, had already been baptized. No one had already been baptized. So people are coming unto him to get baptized, not because they just got saved. They're coming to be baptized because they'd never been baptized before. So part of the preparation, and you could go into, I'm not going to spend time into that, going into baptism and what it all means, you know, how you're dying to self and, you know, you're buried with your sins, you know, and, and, and raising to... to walk in newness of life and all the symbolism and, and the way that that kind of helps you in your spiritual life. You're, you're obeying God. You're doing all these things. So people are coming here and they're confessing their sins. Why? They're getting right with God. They're not confessing all of their sins in order to get saved. These are, I believe these are saved people that are coming up and just, man, I haven't been doing what's right. I need a fresh start. I'm going to get baptized. John the Baptist, man, he's saying it like it is. That's the truth right there. I need to get things right. I'm confessing my sins to God right now. I'm confessing. I'm forsaking. And I'm going to bury those sins today through baptism and, and walk in newness of life. And again, it's not a literal, like, 
It's not, it's not the water that's cleansing them of their sins. It's symbolic, but it's, it's something that they're doing to move forward and they're confessing their sins and they're saying, I'm going to live for God. And that's, that's part of baptism. That should be part of baptism. That's one thing that I've seen frequently. It's something that, that I've experienced in my own life. After getting baptized, man, I really got serious about serving the Lord. And we even see in this passage, we're going to see too, Jesus gets baptized before he really starts his ministry. This is what kicks it off. For you know, the first 30 years of his life, we see a just a couple of little stories of Jesus you know, being born and then as a child, his whole life, though, up until he starts his ministry, we have no idea what he was doing. But as soon as he gets baptized, man, that's when he just goes on his mission and does all of the things that he was supposed to do and needed to do for the Father. And it started with his baptism. That's, that's the beginning. So this confessing of sins, I don't believe someone has to confess all of their sins to be saved. And this is another one of those reasons why you know, people read this and, and you kind of forget because we've had baptism for so long and normally when someone gets saved, we want to get them baptized right away. We forget that people had never been baptized before this. So you've got a bunch of saved people that had never been baptized before coming to John and seeking John out. Hey man, here's this guy. He's baptizing people. It's a new thing. They had already been saved. He's a preacher of truth, a preacher of righteousness, and trying to prepare the, the way of the Lord. So they're all coming and just getting right with God, confessing their sins to God, not to John. You know, they're, they're getting right with God and getting baptized. But I think this adds to some people's confusion of saying, well, see, he's saying everyone had to repent of their sins. That's why they're confessing their sins when they're getting baptized. No, these people were already saved. These ones, I'm, like I said, I'm sure there's people getting saved and then baptized, but these people who are just getting right with God, they're confessing their sins. Um, I also just want to add too, you know, confessing of sins. This isn't brought up very much in the Bible at all because it's not necessary for a person to confess their sins like to someone else to be absolved. Like the Catholic Church teaches, you have to go into a closet and, and, and tell this priest all your sins so that he can pray for you and tell you what you need to do for your penance to get right with God and all this other stuff. That's not found anywhere in Scripture. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. One mediator. It's not, it's not the priest in the box. It's not Mary the mediate tricks that they teach is the go-between between you and Jesus, and then Jesus goes between you and God. No, we go straight to Jesus, right? He's the mediator between us and God. And you know why he's the mediator? Because he died for our sins. That's why. That's what reconciles us to God is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's all we need. And the Bible says in John 16, Jesus says this in John 16, 23, And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. He's saying, we can go straight to the Father ourselves. Because anything you ask in my name, he's going to give it to you. In verse 26, he says, At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. So he's saying you don't even have to go like literally like, like pray to Jesus to pray to the Father for you. You don't need to do that. You don't need to go. Jesus has reconciled you. That's why he's the mediator because he's, he's made you right with God so that you can just directly go straight to God. You can boldly come under the throne of God. Amen. That's good news. We don't need a man. We don't need a priest. We don't need anybody else to confess to other than, than the Lord. Confess our sins unto Him. Hey, confess and forsake. Yes, God wants us to do that. Yes, we should do that. And you know what, though? That still works. When you're forsaking your sin, that doesn't save your soul either. Faith in Jesus, He becomes your mediator. That saves you. Matthew chapter 3. Let's go back here. Verse number 7. Now we're... we're you know, we, we're in a story here. John is baptizing people. But now he starts addressing these false prophets, these Pharisees and Sadducees that show up. So he's got a bunch of people showing up. They're interested in what, they have to, what he has to say. Saved people, unsaved people, whatever. You know, people getting saved. 
people getting baptized, and then he's got these Pharisees now. They show up. Well, what's this guy doing out here? Right? It says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? One more example of Baptist preaching. Oh, why, why do you have to be so hard? Why do you have to say those things? Why can't we all just get along? Why can't you just join up and yoke up with everybody who calls themselves a Christian? Why do you have to be mean? Yeah, John the Baptist. What are you doing? You're calling them vipers. Don't you know that they claim to follow Moses and the law? They're snakes. They're vipers. He's calling them for what they are. And that's why we need preaching against the false prophets that are out there that are going to put on the sheep's clothing. They're going to try to pass themselves off as Christian. But in their heart, they're full of dead men's bones. They're full of wickedness and they're serpents and they're wolves in sheep's clothing. And they're out to destroy. And we need to call them out just like John the Baptist did. You bunch of vipers. Who warned you about hell? Who warned you about the coming destruction of your souls? Verse 8, that's why he says unto them, Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. You're saying, you, you know, if you want to get baptized, why don't you start showing me that you actually did change your mind? You did change your belief. You are now going to put all of your faith in the Lord for your salvation and not in the law and not in your own works and not in your own righteousness. And when he says, bring forth fruit to meet for repentance, he says, he follows that up in verse 9, and think not, this is the contrary, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. These Pharisees and Sadducees, they were trusting in the fact that they were Hebrews, the stock of Israel, God's chosen people. I am a child of Abraham. Abraham is our father. That's what they're trusting in. You know what that's going to get them? Nowhere. That's why he said God's able of these stones. That the fact that you're a physical child of Abraham means nothing. Because if God wants to, he could just take these stones and, and raise up children unto Abraham. That's not what matters at all. It's the faith. So, because they had that attitude, that's what he's saying, we'll bring forth fruits we meet for repentance. There's a difference when, you're, when he's talking to false prophets and looking for more evidence of salvation than anyone else. You're never going to see you know, people being judged, well, are they saved or not? Because, they, you know, it's always in reference to false prophets. Now, I'm going to get into this a lot more when we get into Matthew chapter 7. So I don't want to preach too deeply on this right now because Matthew 7 covers, you know, n knowing the fruit, knowing the tree by the fruit. And that's all in regard to being a false prophet or a false teacher, being that tree, being someone who actually reproduces as opposed to just the fruit that doesn't reproduce and doesn't bring forth anything else. You don't know what kind that is and you're not looking to, you know, once you have an apple, you don't need to know, is that an apple? But if you have a tree, well, I don't know. Is that an apple tree, an orange tree, or a pear tree? Well, what's it bringing forth? Yep. That's when you look at the fruit. Oh, well, it's bringing forth apples. It must be an apple tree. But anyways, I'm going to get into all that in Matthew chapter 7. So, but we see this ties in with the same exact teaching of knowing them by their fruits. And he's saying, Hey, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. Because they were leaders, they were teachers, they were prophets, supposedly. Well, show me what you're bringing forth then as a prophet, is what he's saying. And I think that's reasonable to ask of, of someone who's claiming, if they're claiming to believe and they're a prophet, no, we want to we wanna see this. The physical children of Abraham, though, in verse number 9, they're not able to save anyone. Let's keep reading in verse number 10. Because he brings up, again, he continues on with the theme of, of these trees. 
that these false prophets are trees. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Another reference to these false prophets being trees and bringing forth fruit. Because every, every prophet or preacher or whatever, you know, a pastor of a church, they're bringing forth fruit. They should be. I mean, you know the, the results of the work of the labor of the prophet, the so-called prophet, based on who's following him. Who, who are they converting and, and what do they believe? What do the, what do the converts believe? believe that's the fruit of the ministry of, of any prophet or whatever. And when you've got somebody claiming to be a Christian, claiming to believe that salvation is by grace through faith, but then you talk to every single person in the congregation and not one of them saved, because not one of them, they're all giving you an answer of, well, I got to do what's right. Well, I got to live the right life. Well, I got to repent of my sins. Well, I've got to... Well, that's just showing you that there's no good fruit. Well, that tree then must not be a good tree. If you're getting no good fruit from it, not a good tree. Pretty simple. And he's saying, you know what? All the bad trees, you know what God's going to do to them? He's going to cut them down, chop them down, and throw them in the fire. Because what's it good for? I don't want a bad tree. I want a good tree. Bring forth good fruit. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 11. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, notice this sentence doesn't stop here. There's actually a colon after the word fire there. And then in verse 12, it says, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, as I was studying and thinking about this, I've thought about this passage in the past. You know, well, how does, how is Jesus going to baptize people with the Holy Ghost and with fire? And I think people have a, have a concept of, you know, it's, it's easy to understand what it means to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. We see many examples of that. We see, you know, believers getting baptized with the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost comes upon them and they're bold and they preach the gospel or maybe they perform miracles or whatever, you know, God's spirit comes upon them and they're doing great things. So, yeah, no problem with that. But what does it mean with and with fire? And I think the misunderstanding, I don't think, personally, I don't think he's referring to the same group of people here in this sentence where he says, baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I think he's referring to two different groups. Now, because I've thought about this, the only thing I could come up with to teach that this is referring to the same group is like in Acts chapter 2, we see the disciples they're baptized with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost engulfs them, and they have the, the tongues. It says, like as a fire, the cloven tongues, like as a fire. Okay. And they're able to, to you know, obviously pre speak with other tongues and things like that. But that's not really the same as being baptized with fire. But I can see, okay, you want to believe that maybe. Seems like more of a stretch to me, but I think he's referring to either people being saved and getting baptized with the Holy Ghost and, and having great power, or just being baptized with fire, because baptism just means immersed. I mean, you're surrounded by fire, and who gets surrounded by fire? People who go to hell. Well, which is why I also believe this sentence doesn't end in verse 11, but continues when he says, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather his wheat into the garner, the wheat, the saved, and, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So I think he's saying, hey, Jesus, who's going to come, he could baptize you with the Holy Ghost or he could baptize you with fire. And when he comes in to, to clear everything up, it's going to be one or the other. And that's, I think it's pretty clear that's what it's talking about here, baptizing someone with fire. I don't think we should be looking for a baptism with fire. I mean, yes, you, could, you can read where people are like, you know, they have a burning in their bosom, right? When, when you don't, uh, when you decide not to preach the word of God, but that still doesn't suggest a full baptism in fire to me. I, I think that would be a stretch to say this is talking about believers. I think it's clear, saved, unsaved, wheat, chaff, that's what he's coming to do. There's obviously a division when Jesus comes. People either receive him or they don't. 
Verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And this is just one more example of someone coming to John to be baptized who was already saved, not like Jesus needed to be saved. He's already perfect and righteous and everything else. But he's coming forth from Galilee to Jordan unto John. He's seeking him out to be baptized of him. And again, that's another good thing. But um, yeah, sorry, I got in my notes. I've already covered like everything on this whole passage earlier in the sermon. But um, he's also seeking out John. Jesus is going to be baptized of John. Um, while, while I do believe that, you know, the Bible doesn't talk a whole lot about the person doing the baptism as, as being stressed as the most important thing. You know, how the baptism's performed. Is it performed, you know, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost? Those things come up. Right? We're instructed on how to do that. But the actual person administering the baptisms, you don't see a whole lot about that. You know, I've been asked this question many, many times regarding baptism. Hey, do you think there's a legitimate baptism? I would say if you got baptized in a place where they're preaching the right gospel and you know, under that authority they're they're pre they're baptizing right, they're they're basically preaching right. I think that's a legitimate baptism. Now, if it's just a totally false religion, I mean, you get baptized in the Catholic Church or just some Pentecostal church that tells you you could lose your salvation and everything else, I would say, you know what? You probably ought to get baptized again. Jesus sought out John to be baptized of him, specifically. And, and he made the trip from Galilee to Jordan. So I'm going to go get baptized of John. And didn't tell someone else to baptize him. He said, no, I'm going to go get baptized of John. And uh, he tells them here when he comes up to him in verse 14, he says, but John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So what Jesus tells John, he says, allow it. Suffer means to allow it. Like, go through with this, suffer this, al allow yourself to baptize me, even though Jesus knows he's a better than John, he's above John, he's the son of God, right? But he needed to do it. Why? For thus it becometh us, both of us, to fulfill all righteousness. So in order for Jesus to fulfill all righteousness, he needed to be baptized. He needed to be baptized of John. Now, he didn't need to be saved, but he needed to be baptized. And... I believe, just like we see in other places, it's a commandment for people to be baptized. Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness. One of those things he was doing was getting baptized. It is, uh, it is important. People ought to be baptized. And as, as much as you can, if you've never been baptized before, seek out someone who's a John the Baptist you know, to, to baptize you if you can. If not, just find, I mean, find someone who's, who's following the Lord who's going to be pointing people, behold the Lamb of God. It doesn't have to be the, the, the most dynamic person in the world, but if someone's out there doing like John the Baptist said, hey, behold the Lamb of God, follow him. He must increase, I must decrease. Get baptized of him. It's, it's pretty simple. You don't want to overcomplicate things. It says, then he suffered him. Now, um, also just one quick reference here. Since Jesus said, you know, he needed to do it to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus did everything that his father commanded him to do. So we could, you know, it could be implied here that God, you know, the father wanted Jesus to be baptized here. He, Jesus himself said in John 8, 29, and he that sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone for I do always those things that please him. Look, everything that he did, everything that the Father instructed him to do, he did. He's always doing those things that please him. And he ended up getting baptized to fulfill all righteousness. So um, let's keep reading here. Verse number 16. We're almost done with the passage. Verse number 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now, Again, I just preached on baptism not that long ago, 
But the fact that Jesus Christ came up straightway out of the water means he was in the water. And why is he in the water? Because he needed to be immersed. He needed to be fully dunked underwater to be baptized. That's what baptism is. It's immersion. It's not sprinkling. It's not pouring. It's not any other thing other than getting down into the water, getting dunked, and coming back up. But then after he gets baptized, he comes up out of the water, and they see this vision. You know, the heavens are opened unto him. It says, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now, the Bible says another place that the, the spirit descends like in bodily form. You know, the, you see pictures out there of like a dove. It wasn't a dove coming down from heaven and coming on Jesus Christ. It says it descended like a dove. So if you imagine a dove floating or flying in the air, that's how the spirit came down. But the spirit came down in bodily form upon Jesus, not in the form of an animal, right? So be careful when you read that just because you may see artist depictions or trinkets or whatever of like some dove coming down and lighting upon Jesus. It's not an actual dove. It is the spirit that the spirit of God that's descending from heaven and coming upon Jesus Christ. And notice the spirit of God really comes on him. And that's when he just after his baptism of water, he's essentially being baptized with the Holy Ghost and surrounded and engulfed by the Holy Ghost. And he starts to go out and really start his ministry and do the great works um, of, of his ministry that he hadn't really done before. In verse number 17, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Um, so we see a lot of things going on in this chapter. Uh, John the Baptist, Jesus starting his ministry, obviously going forward. Now we're going to start to see all the rest of the works of Jesus Christ in action. So be here for that next week. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the great truths that can be found in your word. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to... Um, be zealous about learning and reading from your word. Lord, help us to do it every day and, and to put aside our flesh and to not allow ourselves to get weary and, and just pretend like we don't have enough time to read your word. Lord, it ought to be very important for us. And I pray that you please just open up our understanding, give us wisdom and knowledge. Lord, we want to be used of you in a mighty way and, and we would like to please you as well. Lord, help us to, uh, to do what's right. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.